Hi everyone, Harold Szymanski here of MBA Mission. I hope you're all doing well. We're here today to talk about all you need to know about MIT Sloan. And obviously I'm the presenter here and I'm the presenter here for good reasons. I'm a graduate of MIT Sloan. Uh, I got an MBA there 99, so quite a few years ago. The, the reality is, is that I still have very close ties to MIT Sloan, both through the entrepreneurship community, my office, when I went into my office, was across the street from MIT Sloan. I'm over at MIT Sloan all the time. Uh, they happen to have a great cafeteria and dining hall and very inexpensive. So I walk over there across the street, not infrequently. And uh, at this point, I know folks in the admissions committee. Uh, I know Donna Levinson quite well. So I do believe at, uh, at MBA Mission, I am, in fact, the Sloan guy. But we have a couple of other Sloan guys. Uh, which I'll tell you about at the end. So, but let's talk a little bit about MIT Sloan now. And I'm not sure it's all you need to know about MIT Sloan. So I say that to you guys in the context of, if you have not yet done so, sign up with MBA Mission for your free 30-minute consult. Uh, you can speak to me. I'll put some uh, appointments on the board for next week. You can speak to really any of our members of our team who uh, have been doing this a long time, 30 minutes. We're not salespeople. And just to hear what your thinking is, and for us to give you a little bit of background. With that in mind, so let's talk about MIT Sloan. We're going to start with what I like to say Sloan by the numbers, just a very general conversation about how to choose a business school, as well as how MIT compares to some to other business schools. More specifically, once we work through that, we're going to talk about what makes Sloan different. I use the term here, met at, met at, met at menus which means mind and hand, which is the motto of MIT generally, and see how that plays into the MIT Sloan culture, philosophy, and it really does. Uh, and one of the things that we're gonna try to answer today is what we advertise is, is MIT Sloan, is it really just a tech school? And the answer is no. And I'm living proof of that. Uh, for those of you who don't know me very well, I worked in government for a member of Congress for about a number of years. I went to business school a little bit older when I was 30, and I was a poet in the vernacular of uh, the different categories of students there. I had no tech background whatsoever. I had no very little quantitative background, but I still thrived there, I'd say, and it was still a great place for me and likely a great place for many of you. Um, so let's talk about Sloan by the numbers. And again, this is going to be a little bit of a broader conversation about what to think about when you pick business schools. So let's just start off with the most physical of all of them. Different business schools uh, exist in different locations. There are going to be some that are in urban campus, meaning right in the city. Uh, we speak to some issues around decentralized, more expensive, closer to recruiters and network. Oh, yes, some more, some no. Others are going to be a college town, far away from anything other than cows, generally. Uh, and the the issue uh, is is all around, do you want to be part of a very close-knit community that in many ways can be, not always, but can be somewhat insular? So let's think about that in terms of the, probably some of the schools you're looking at. When it comes to urban campuses, MIT Sloan is practically as urban as you can be. I would even go as far as saying it is more urban than Columbia or NYU, certainly more urban than um, uh, Harvard Business School, which is across the river from us, uh, certainly more urban than um, uh, UCLA, which is somewhat far away, certainly more urban than Chicago Booth, middle of Booth, but middle of Chicago, but not really. It's a little island there. Um, we also have the urban college hybrids, Northwestern, Stanford, GS. Uh, Stanford, UC Berkeley Haas, generally it's probably an hour outside the big city. Then you have college towns, small places that the business school, the university is really going to be the center of focus of, of really the whole community there. And Dartmouth Tuck, you will be living with, you'll be eating with, you will be going to school with the same group of folks, same with UVA Darden. Uh, Michigan, you're probably going to be more integrated into the university as a whole. And Duke, you're actually one could make the case it's more of an urban or college hybrid. Um, and with that in mind, uh, let's just talk a little bit more about um, uh, the different uh, differentiators in terms of business schools. You have a large versus small. We make the cutoff here around 400. 
the reality is, is that um, uh, maybe it's closer to 500. It really doesn't matter. As you'll see, some schools are really big and some schools are really small. In fact, this is this one could say is one of the biggest uh, differences among these different schools. The curriculums, I think, are frequently pretty close, though not always. We'll go into that. But the size can really matter. Again, Dartmouth Tuck, a school I happen to love, 284 students. But again, you are with them every single day. You are, like I said, eating with them, living with them, talking with them, socializing with them. Uh, and in many ways, that is probably the most extreme. Uh, as opposed to HBS, almost a thousand students, uh, you will get to know some. You will get to know folks in your section, probably about 90. You will get to know them very well. The other 800, you're going to get to know less well. Uh, MIT Sloan, Stanford, Duke is really just in the middle. Uh, and 400, uh, it's a good size. And let me tell you why. You're going to really get to know your classmates, your section mates, that uh, the folks you take the core with about, uh, you know, let's say about 80 people, 70 people. And then you have to essentially meet another 300 people over the course of uh, two years. And you can do it. You should be able to leave these mid-range schools basically knowing everyone. Um, and can the same be said about a place like Columbia? Depends on how social you are, but it certainly is harder. Um, and, and also just to point out one thing, and it's sort of a small point here, is when you think about schools, whether it's urban, rural, is think about what happens at night. Are people going off campus? Do they already have a network? Uh, do they have their friends? And that also in influences things. Um, so even though uh, a school like Berkeley may have a very small business school class, actually folks could already have a network of developed uh, friends in Northern, Northern California. So for better or worse, just a small point here, uh, MIT Sloan will talk about it. It's core curriculum first, uh, first semester. And during that first, first semester in your classes with you, in your sections with you will be about 35 to 50 folks who are doing a master's in engineering along with an MBA. We get different flavor. So for, for MIT, you could even argue the class size is maybe closer to 450. Uh, but again, very, in many ways, it's always dependent on who you are and how engaged you are. Um, so again, class size and structure, uh, uh, students per section. And these are the folks who you really get to know best. These are the folks who you're going to be spending a semester with in all classes or a year with in all classes. So at any school, 70, you'll get to know them super well. At MIT, it's only first semester core. HBS, nine, you'll get to know the people super well. Uh, for them, it's a one-year core. Um, and here's the, the curriculum. Uh, and this whole idea of there's a flexible curriculum, which means the, the number of mandatory courses, particularly the core, may be less. And there's a mandatory curriculum. Re courses required uh, are, can be quite a bit more. Simply put, uh, for HBS Tuck Darden, a full year in many cases, I mean, if you talk about the case method, uh, for MIT Sloan, uh, one semester of courses, of the core courses, where you'll all be together, your 70 of you, the flip side is Chicago Booth, one required course, so tremendous flexibility. And that overstates things because there are uh, different categories of courses you have to take. But the reality is, is, is that is about the most flexible school. Um, and here we talk about core courses. You can see here at MIT Sloan, one full semester core courses. You cannot wave out of courses. And what that means, if you're an accountant, you have to take accounting as opposed to, uh, as opposed to um, Columbia, where... 40% uh, core courses, so more core courses, but the reality is if you're an accountant, you do not have to take accounting. So like, a little bit different flavors, different little wrinkles there, but again, MIT, we're here to talk about MIT. Uh, one semester, all together, uh, you're required to take certain courses and you have to take all of them. Um, we always talk a little bit about the pedagogy in terms of case versus lectures. There's always an ongoing debate which is the case method where you put into a situation, a real business situation, and in your class, you really have to hash it out. Is that a better way to learn than lecture, which is traditional, very frontal, as they like to say, a professor imparting knowledge onto you? 
it's never quite that extreme. Frequently, there's a lot of study groups. Thinkingly, the class actual conversations in classroom can be quite robust. But again, these are these are different ways of looking at your courses. Um, and and the most extreme, the philosophy around Harvard Business School is case method. So your courses are really going to be case method based. Uh, that's where you're going to be doing at the end of the day at Harvard Business School. You'll do something like 400 cases and for, again, little stories uh, um, about a uh, different business situations. There's no lectures there, which overstates it a little bit because there are what's called class notes or, or pieces of a textbook to look at. And this experiential learning, which I'll talk about, about 15 percent. So in the case of Sloan, about a third are going to be cases. Okay, and again, these real life situations, 25 percent are going to be lectures and maybe most important in terms of a differentiator for some of these schools is experiential learning team projects. That's basically where they pick you up, put you in a real situation, not a case, a real situation. And you hammer out a business problem with your classmates as well as for a startup, an existing company, a consulting firm. And in many ways, that is the most true to life experience you can get at business schools. And you can see here, MIT Sloan splits everything down the middle or a third, a third, a third, roughly. And is that the best way to go? It's very dependent. It's dependent on sort of who you are. I am a person who likes to approach things in different manners. So for me, it worked out really nicely. Uh, other folks feel like uh, more robust curriculum or stricter curriculum. A lot of cases, a lot of working with your classmates makes more sense for them. And again, this is something probably to um, to think a little bit more deeply about. And we have some resources as well. And just to make another commercial here, if you have any questions about this, how do how different schools approach their learning styles, give us a call. 30 minutes free. We can talk about whatever you want. Okay. So now let's talk a little bit more about what makes Sloan different. And I always start off with Mens et Menos, which is their actual motto, mind and hand. And it really speaks to uh, how uh, MIT, generally MIT Sloan in particular, um, thinks about what its education looks like, as well as what some expectations are as far as a professional goes. This idea here of it's not learning for learning's sake, it is rather learning to have a true application. It's something that, yes, it is learning, but it's all in the service of having impact. So one thing that's really central to the Sloan experience is the notion of what's called action learning or action learning labs. And what that means is it is a requirement. It is really central to the curriculum that you take some of your learnings from some of the courses you, you have uh, taken and you actually put them to use. You operationalize them in a uh, team with your classmates in real companies. The companies can actually be across the world d approaching very, very different types of business problems. And again, it is, it is very important. And this is what Sloan was probably a real pioneer in. And they've been doing it for probably about 15 years of really getting people out of the classroom into different um, companies, into different uh, organizations. Um, it doesn't really stop there. Action Learning Labs is also about professional growth and everyone will have really a, a menu of skills they wanna develop. And it is really part of the process to be inside a company, but also be very focused on what do you need to do to be a better professional. And when it comes to MIT, you have a lot of choice around that. And part of it is dependent on, of course, what you want to learn, the industry you want to go into, or just some curiosity. The, the reality is, is that uh, you can be curious about companies, uh, about countries, in terms of they have China Lab, which basically you're going to be working for a Chinese company. Yeah, in the past, it's included going there. Uh, COVID is probably more restrictive than that, but I would anticipate you going over there for some period of time. Israel Lab right now is is one of the most popular action learning labs because just uh, startup nation. I think there were something like 200 students over the course of two years who actually participated in Israel lab. Uh, and then, but then there are other labs focused on other things. I think there's a couple of uh, focused on entrepreneurship. Again, you go into a company, a startup, and you help them figure out some business problems. If it's local or if it's in domestic, that's called the Entrepreneurship Lab, E-Lab, which I participated in years ago, or this is the Global 
entrepreneurship lab where you go somewhere else, somewhere around the world to help a startup. You can also focus on subject matter. So for example, uh, the healthcare lab, uh, the enterprise management lab in terms of enterprise management is all about being inside a big company, finance lab, being inside of a uh, investment bank, a private equity firm, uh, and organization lab, it's all about organizational behavior, basically companies that are really uh, are struggling uh, in some dimension. And you are given, you as a team are given um, responsibility for sort of figuring things out. I think there's a couple of really interesting labs um, that are not so new anymore, but they, they used to be new, um, which is called the Sustainable Business Lab. I think that's great. MIT, and it's a longer conversation, MIT and MIT Sloan has made fit, uh, sustainability really top of uh, top of mind for them. Big agenda around that. In fact, uh, if you dig a little deeper on the MIT Sloan website, you will find a man by the name of Jason Jay, who's head of sustainability initiatives. A lot of commitment, a lot of resources, the issues around sustainability. You can push that, explore that a little bit more in the sustainable business uh, action lab. I think one of the newest action labs, which I find really interesting, is called the USA Lab. And that's all about how do you promote economic development in areas outside of the real uh, business hubs. This idea here of obviously, like many countries, uh, the United States is really um, struggling with income inequality, meaning you have the uh, uh, you have both coasts and then uh, very in a very deprecating way, people call everything in between the flyover part of our country, meaning this idea here, people don't spend a lot of time thinking about it, but obviously economic development is really important in these places. So the USA lab, you may be sent to a city like a city like Nashville, for example, a city even deeper uh, in a Little Rock, Arkansas, with the idea here of, OK, help this region, help this city generate more economic development. This, I think, is a really interesting lab, certainly if you have an interest in impact investing uh, or just social impact more generally. This would be something that's really unique. No other school is doing this to send you to a place that really is struggling and you're having to figure out, OK, um, what do we do about this? Um, if you wanted to even drill down a few more in a few different other disciplines, they have MIT wide certificates, meaning MI, any MIT student, uh, not of, of course, MIT Sloan students can get an actual certificate in sustainability, healthcare, or business analytics. And again, it is just deeper study. You leave with something that you can put on your resume. Obviously, it doesn't it doesn't really uh, change the requirement to do core courses to make sure you meet your requirements. But again, it is an opportunity to drill down on something even deeper. Um, obviously, these are all very, very popular right now. So um, it wasn't actually clear to me where to fit this in. But what makes Sloan different? This idea of, again, men's at menos. And what that also means is MIT's philosophy is this notion of past is prologue. That there's no way of knowing when you're just starting business school the impact you're going to have. Everyone can have aspirations. Is that really, is the size of your aspiration a something that is going to really uh, impact your classmates or even impact your future? Because everyone can have aspirations. So MIT, more than any other schools, says very forthrightly, there is no better indication of the likelihood of your future success than past success. This notion of past is prologue, which in the extremists, we don't care what you want to do. We don't believe you. That's what I tell my clients. MIT doesn't believe when you say you want to do something. Rather, they say, what have you done in the past? If I want to know what you've done in the past, then I'll really be able to understand what you want to do in the future or have uh, belief in what you will do in the future, have confidence that you can do something uh, really impactful in the future. So again, unlike other schools, particularly a school like Stanford, which is the most aspirational. Uh, Stanford's all about um, changing the world, changing organizations, changing yourself, very future looking. Uh, that's not MIT. That's not MIT at all. Rather, it's tell me what you, how you've succeeded in the past. This is very important when you do your application. And then I'll have a better sense of, of who you are and what I can expect from you. 
So uh, let me share some other ways that uh, MIT Sloan is different. It is, again, unlike other schools, uh, it is very much integrated into its university and even more broadly into its community. So, so at MIT Sloan, like at many schools, but maybe in, in an even more extreme way, is you can participate in other part, pieces of the campus uh, and you will also have in your classes and in your study groups and in your teams, folks who are coming from other parts of the campus. So for example, if you are interested in computer science, you can go take a course in the computer science department very, very easily. You can take a course with PhD students. Certainly there's a lot of PhD in economic and finance students floating around. Um, there's always a few undergrads. I myself uh, was in a team with an undergrad, uh, actually, uh, who was starting his own company at the age of about 2021. 20, and uh, I've kept in touch with him. I just, in fact, exchanged uh, some emails with him and he succeeded. He left MIT, again, not MIT Sloan. He left MIT at 21 and has spent the past 20 years just building one company after the other. And even we knew it at the, at the time. So you could see undergrads like that uh, and the, re the reality is, is the MIT Sloan is just one piece of the broader campus. It's also one piece of the broader community. And we'll get to a little bit, but MIT Sloan is snack, smack dab in the middle of, of Kendall Square, Cambridge, uh, which an argument could be made, and I would make it, that Kendall Square is the center of East Coast entrepreneurship. Obviously, there are other places, uh, certainly. Uh, one could maybe make the argument that in New York, it's Silicon Alley. Uh, but the reality is, is that when MIT Sloan is the middle of a place that has 62 public companies within blocks of each other, uh, dozens of venture capital firms. I wasn't sure of the number. The last one I heard was, was 36. I'm not sure if that number is still right, uh, but that's what you're looking at right here. And we're talking blocks away. This is a physically a very small place. Um, it really is certainly the... Uh, the center of biotech. And um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that to the point that something like $13.6 billion have been raised by biotech companies just in 2021. And biotech in Candle Square means anything from the big companies, the uh, Amgens, the um, uh, who else? Uh, Smith Klein, Blackstone Smith Klein, they're all there. Uh, but the reality is, again, who's who's in some of these uh, office spaces, lab spaces that have been built, uh, shared lab spaces that have been built in Kendall Square? It is also these tiny companies as well. And a lot of that is coming out of what's called the Broad Institute in particular, the Broad Center. And not to get too detailed here, it is a uh, it is um, a cooperation, an institute that's a cooperation between Harvard and um, MIT. It is two blocks away from MIT Sloan, a lot of connections there. And for those who are a little bit more knowledgeable, Broad Center actually holds the patent for CRISPR technology, which is gene splicing. So it is, today it's probably 1 billion industry, tomorrow it'll be a $10 billion industry. There's also something called the Whitehead Institute, again, same, same place, all around biology. Um, more broadly, there's the Trust Center, the Entrepreneurship Center at MIT, which coming and going from people all from all over the campus. Uh, physically, it's there. And you also have the MIT Media Lab, which is where they're inventing the future every day. And where MIT Sloanans are, where Media Lab people come to Sloan, it is just incredibly well integrated. And not to pick on some other schools, but the reality is, is there's no school that's integrated like this. There, there simply isn't. If you go across the river to HBS, yes, they also have an entrepreneurship center, but the reality is, is that it is next to the business school and it's not next to anything else. And you're just not going to have the same sort of integration with the broader university. So is MIT Sloan really a tech school? The answer is no. Again, whether I'm living proof, my clients are living proof. The reality is MIT Sloan is very cognizant of how it may be perceived and looks out for people who break the stereotype. Um, so from the numbers perspective, uh, obviously students are coming from all different backgrounds. You see tech is only 16% compared to financial services, meaning financial analysts, investment banking, private equity, corporate finance, or consultant. And the numbers look just about like most top business schools. The issue is probably even a little bit less for tech. 
And the reason for that, they're making room, MIT Sloan is making places for poets, for folks with really interesting backgrounds. And MIT Sloan is frequently the only place. Uh, there are certain clients of mine that if I think they have a chance at a top business school, it's only at MIT Sloan. Because MIT Sloan is, is willing to take the quirky, a little bit older students, folks who are coming with, again, these non-traditional backgrounds, uh, folks who are just interesting and smart. Because at the end of the day, what's Sloan looking for? It's looking for smart. It's looking for success. Um, other, listen, other different ways of seeing how Sloan's not a tech school is the top employers look like everybody else. BCG, McKinsey, Amazon, Google, Bain, Amgen, Danaher, uh, with the, I guess, probably somewhat biased towards the biotech world. It's just, and, and I tell folks all the time, I tell my clients all the time, if you're thinking about biotech, the place is MIT Sloan. You can make the argument for a lot of other places, a lot of other disciplines, but when you're talking biotech, then it really is MIT Sloan. Um, and it also, the wide range of interests of students at MIT Sloan also manifests in a few other ways. First of all, sustainability is big. You start having these really interesting approaches to the world. One is sports analytics. There's this sports analytics conference. Uh, the general manager of Philadelphia 76ers is a Sloan graduate who uses the, the concept of, of uh, um, analytics or cyber uh, technology, um, data hacking um, in order to make professional teams just better. And like I said, there's a conference every year at Sloan. Sloan sort of, one would say, the inventor of that. I think also when you put smart people together and they think about difficult social problems, then they take different approaches. So MIT Sloan has what's called the Hacking the Arts Festival. I don't even know what it is, <laughs> which is the idea here. You have some Sloan students, you have students from around the, the uh, university who basically get together and think about different ways of approaching art. Uh, and uh, spend 48 hours creating an art project and really interesting. MIT also has um, obviously diversity and inclusion is a hot topic everywhere. I just participated in a um, actually a round table. I, I was one of a few, quite a few participants with the mayors of, at the, of Boston, uh, Chicago and um, San Francisco all African-American women talking about issues around DNI. Um, MIT is also known for uh, its organizational behavior department, meaning things like leadership, things like putting together strong organization, learning organizations. Uh, and one would say, one could say it's probably um, the top in that as well. Every couple of years, a Sloan professor writes a one of those business books that everyone ends up reading in terms of learning organizations. How do you make things better and better? Um, and something, if you have a, a pension for some of the softer issues around business, something that it, you can certainly study very well there. Um, so what, is, what does Sloan want in its students? And, and again, another commercial, talk to us for 30 minutes. We can uh, essentially look through your own profile and give you a sense of things. Um, genuine people, confident people, the, re the reality is, is that there's not a lot of BS at Sloan. Uh, there's no way of sort of uh, hiding who you are. Uh, the reality is it's, it's a small community and a community that asks a lot of questions, that you will be questioned. People in a very kind way will want to understand who you are. Um, obviously, doers getting to that men's and menace approach, uh, smart. Uh, maybe I'm the only exception. People are very smart than MIT. Uh, your classmates are going to be very smart, very soft-spoken, but very sm smart, Sloan knowledgeable. I joke with people that MIT Sloan doesn't want just to be your first choice business school. It wants to be your only choice business school. And what I mean by that, again, the unique culture, the unique characteristics of MIT Sloan, they want you to know about. As you approach the school, as you share your application, you share your profile with them, it is going to be very important that you indicate very clearly why it's Sloan, why it's only Sloan. How are you going to be a community member? What are you going to do there? How are you going to take advantage of all the resources there? Which is the most exciting for you? Uh, so again, if you say you want to go to Sloan because it's a quant-driven school and you're an engineer, that's sort of a no-go, to be perfectly honest with you. Uh, they want you to dig down a lot deeper and they fully recognize what the reputation is, which is something of a contrast to what it really is. And they want you to understand what that community looks like. Um, 
And this I spend a lot of time talking to my clients about. That first, uh, um, that first iteration of their essay is generally, I'm an engineer and I want to go to an engineering school. And that's, like I said, at that point, we stop. At that point, I have them talk to Sloan folks, get to know the curriculum, go on webinars, and then you will have a better sense of what Sloan's all about. Okay, so now I have, again, the big commercial about who we are at, at MBA Mission. Um, so um, we can go through this. I mean, honestly, a lot of gold stars for us. We're the number one firm. We're the highest rated firm. Um, uh, it's, we're the only firm that Manhattan prep, the number one prep company recommends, um, all of us are full-time consultants, meaning we don't have day jobs. This is number one. Um, and something just popped up about our free consultations. Yes. Give us a call 30 minutes, meet with any one of our, uh, consultants and they can certainly help you think through and talk through your, your, um, candidacy a little bit. Um, I'm pressing unprecedented collaboration among the MBA admissions team. There's 25 of us. Uh, if I have a question, I go on Slack. If it's something I haven't seen before, or I talk to one of my, um, to one of my colleagues. Um, there are some things I myself don't know about MIT that even that another college might. Um, again, it's very, very, um, we're very selective on who our, uh, who our consultants are. Um, I, and we talk about already working for you in terms of events, guides, and more. Let me share with you um, some opportunities to uh, some of our resources. Um, first thing is, if you're interested in MIT Sloan, go on our website, download our insider guide, which really tells you how Sloan is unique and different from other schools. We have a lot of other guides. Uh, we have events. Uh, if you are just at the start of this process in particular, um, download our 300 page starts to finish admi admissions guide. Goes over references, goes over resumes, goes over uh, essays. And again, a great place to start in this process, but obviously a lot, uh, a lot to be learned there. Um, like I said, insider guides about something like the top 20 schools, uh, interview primers again for the top 20 schools, how their interviews are different. Um, we actually have some, what are some valuable publications uh, around different careers, different career choices. So if you say, oh, I wanna go into consulting, but you don't really know what it is, um, by all means, by all means, go grab one of our career guides and that'll help you sort of understand what a career in investment banking, consulting, corporate finance man, looks like. Um, free 30 minute consultation with an MBA missions senior consultant. Um, yes, 25 of us, you can always buy, you can always find someone to talk to if you want to speak to me. And if you don't see uh, 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 my schedule open, um, just shoot me an email and we can certainly arrange something. And this is not a sales call. Uh, we're always talking, happy to talk about our services, but they're on our website. This is let us better understand what you want to do, better understand what your candidacy looks like, and then maybe we can make some recommendations or even just answer some of your questions. Um, again, here's our services, uh, complete start to finish package, walk you through the entire process, hold your hand, help you make a very clear story, uh, adjust your story for each school, help you with your resume, help you with interview prep. There is every part of the process where, where we work with you. You can also buy us for hourly. You just have one issue maybe. You sort of know how your application is coming together. Buy a few hours with us and just we can help you fine tune. When it comes time to do interviews, we do mock interview sessions. One mock interview session that is particularly valuable, I think, for folks is if you get a Wharton interview. That is a different interview. It's called a team-based discussion. Six of you are thrown in a virtual room together to work out a business problem, much as you would as a business school team. So at that point, we do a simulation of that because, again, it is a different type of interview, very daunting for many people. So by all means, look at that. And um, I think that's a lot of value out there. Pre-application strategy, if you're more than two years out, why don't you start uh, talking with us a little bit about how to address your application in order to be, to be most impactful, most positive, uh, most likely of success. Okay, here's our team. And like I said before, you can probably uh, chat with many or most of them. Founders, Jeremy Scheinwald. Um, listen, he, he is uh, uh, the leader, I think, in this industry. Generally been doing it for about 20 years. Great success. 
a couple of our managing directors, which are really the most senior folks on our team, uh, and also the ones who are hardest to schedule with. Um, in fact, they're, I think they're, most, they're already full for um, round one is, is Katie Lewis and Jessica Schlar. Read their reviews. Uh, look at who they are. Uh, and the reality is, is they're really top notch. And if you really uh, have interest in them, the time to speak to them is now. I recognize that they're more expensive. And one of the reasons for that is not because their services are different. Uh, we all do the same. We have great success, I would say. Jessica and I only uh, talk every other day. Uh, and I read her material. She reads my material or my client's material. Um, they are just un in great demand. So uh, in order in some ways to adjust that demand, they're just more expensive. Um, but they're, they're wonderful. What I would say is our mini M MIT team, though all of our consultants do MIT. I could probably throw a few more names on there. Is me. I went there. Uh, Michael, who's been working on MIT for a long time, basically he's a very quant-minded guy. He uh, he uh, spent a lot of time in Deloitte, knows the school very well. Harshad, mechanical engineer from India. A lot of people get comfortable working with someone like him. Uh, again, really a great, great, great M M MIT experience. We could throw on a couple of other people there. Uh, certainly my colleague, Kim, certainly my colleague, Krista. Uh, but again, you can take a look at a, uh, any of us online and by all means, by all means, sign up to talk to any one of us. Okay. Q and A. I'm now going to go to questions and answers. Hopefully I've given you guys enough time. And like I said before, if you have questions that are not answered here, and I know I sound like a broken record. If you have questions that are not answered there, here, maybe the best bet is to sign up with us for 30 second for a 30 minute conversation. Okay. Let's see. I'm going to just walk through these one at a time. Is MIT Sloan a one or two year program? It's a two year program when you do a um, you do an internship uh, during the summer. What profile do you need to get into MIT as a graduate student? Um, I think as a graduate student, you can expect uh, you're going to need a number of years of experience. Uh, before you before it's worthwhile to apply to MIT as well. Um, how important is age when it comes to MIP, MBA applications? Do older candidates have a lower chance of getting into a full-time MBA program like MIT or another program in the U.S.? Thank you. Great question. And the answer, of course, always depends. And what I would say is I only consider a person an older candidate where a different story has to be told once you're about 32, 33, 34, I've had success with a 37-year-old um, getting into these top schools. And you always have to ask yourself, are you an older candidate in terms of age or are you an older candidate in terms of work experience? Because if you have been someone who just didn't go to business school because their career was really going great and they just didn't um, want to stop, then at that point, you wouldn't really be considered an older candidate. You'd be looking, you'd be considered a uh, likely successful candidate. <laughs> when all said and done. If, however, you've been working at the same job since the day you graduated college, if your career has plateaued, uh, if the reality is, is that the, um, business school will probably be less impactful for you, then again, that probably requires a different strategy uh, as far as is approaching a two-year program. Again, two-year program for someone like that is not natural, maybe an executive MBA or or a part-time MBA program may be more natural, but again, it is very much um, dependent on your your candidacy, your story, that that sort of thing. Um, so let me see here as well. We're coming to. Um, do you recommend an MIT for somebody that will like to transition into the enter entertainment industry? Um, and the short answer is yes, but entertainment in this way is probably a little bit non-traditional. Um, and what I mean by that is focused on whatever the most emerging entertainment uh, platform is. Uh, if you're thinking about going to, into what I would say entertainment, more traditional entertainment, this idea here of oh, big broadcast, um, Fox, you know, Fox, uh, Paramount, movie industry, then you'll probably be better off at a place like UCLA, um, which is really obviously in the middle of things. There's a great MBA program that's really focused on entertainment, that people get great jobs after, after that is a school nobody's ever heard of, Chapman. 
Uh, it's not quite in L.A. It's near to L.A., but great ties to the entertainment community. Uh, NYU uh, also has some great um, ties to the entertainment community. You can also do a dual master's at MIT at uh, NYU in terms of entertainment, uh, uh, some sort of master's in entertainment as well as an MBA. Um, again, it really depends. To answer your question, there are opportunities at MIT for entertainment, but there may in fact be some other schools that, that are better suited for you. Um, okay, another question is uh, GMAT score. Uh, how high a GMAT score do I need? Um, and it's probably about the same for MIT as any other school. Other school. So, um, you know, roughly speaking, because like any school, uh, they could fill their class with 790 GMATs. They just can't. It's so competitive right now. And I've certainly seen last year, I saw somebody with a 790 get rejected from all the top schools. He then came to me and we worked together for round two and he's um, got into Booth in Columbia. Um, and what I would say is certainly think about your, your GMAT score um, in this way. Uh, the average for most schools is 720, 730. It's a little bit less for women, a little bit more for men. So for women, we're looking at maybe a 710, 720. For men, we're looking at a 720, 730. Uh, for international students, it really bumps a lot. So instead of a 730, you're looking at maybe a 740. And engineers from an uh, overrepresented demo, overrepresented demographics, Indian male engineer, you're looking at 750 plus. Um, so for, from that perspective, you have to be realistic about your GMAT score. I've also seen folks with a 680. A couple of years ago, I had a woman with a 680 who got into MIT Sloan. Not impossible. They like your story. If they like your story, they'll be your champion. In fact, I think they show a little bit more flexibility with GMAT scores than some of the other top schools. Um, what is the preferred work experience for applying to MIT MBA program? I would say at least, uh, at least it skews a little higher. So for men, for women, it's three to five years. For men, it's probably five to seven years. Um, when all said and done, as far as previous preferred work experience, honestly, um, successful work experience, this idea here of you've shown some success in the past. Uh, and I think that's probably the most important thing as far as industry goes, it, it doesn't really matter. Uh, if you've shown success in the past and uh, you've shown some good progression, then whatever job you've been in is probably going to be fine. Um, okay, let's see what else we have. And we have time for probably two two more questions or so. Um, let me see what pops up here. Um, getting to know the school. Do you think you, you should visit? The short answer is in the past, it was always almost a requirement to visit MIT Sloan for you to be taken seriously to some degree. Um, but that has obviously changed. Not quite sure what's going to happen in the future. Um, as far as scholarships go, another question about scholarships. MIT Sloan can actually be pretty generous. So you have schools that are known for being less generous. Wharton, for example, is known for being less generous. Uh, and there are schools that are known for being more generous. Chicago Booth is more generous. Uh, MIT Sloan is on the more generous piece of the continuum than um, any other school. Um, another question here, which schools are most comparable to MIT Sloan? Great question. Uh, a school that I think is very comparable is Berkeley. Um, again, startup community in um, the middle, of, a, the middle of, an, of an area. There's a lot of startups, very smart people walking around embedded into another big university. Um, I happen to like Berkeley Haas, um, Stanford, Harvard, of course. Um, but the, the reality is, is that um, it, it's so much of it is dependent on where you want to go and what you want to do. Uh, and then obviously there'll be different compliments. Um, a school, just to throw it out there, a school I like a lot, happens to be for entrepreneurship, happens to be UCLA. They spend a lot of resources there. Chicago Booth, a lot of resources in entrepreneurship. Great small school in entrepreneurship. Um, and, and, Again, it really is dependent on what you want to study. Um, thank you. Are you specialized only in MBAs or also in masters? It depends on what masters. Um, we certainly look at masters in finance. Um, that's really data analytics. We have a lot of experience with that, but it generally is, M is MBAs. And in dual degrees, for example, there's an MIT Harvard Kennedy School dual degree. We have a lot of experience in that. Um, but in uh, a couple of other dual degrees, well, Warden has the louder program, Masters in International Studies, I think, in MBA. We have a lot of experience in that. Master of Finance, yes. 
We have a lot of experience at Master of Finance. Yes, I know the MIT Sloan Master of Finance very well. It is very, very difficult to get into. I think when all said and done, it's excuse for younger students as well. Um, great then. So with that in mind, um, we have time for maybe one more question. And again, if you are wondering, um, if you have more questions, um, sign up with us for a three, uh, 20 minute, uh, excuse me, 30 minute conversation. Does MIT MBA have the STEM designation? Yes, it does. At least I think it does. Last I checked it did. Also, how good is MIT in terms of management and organizational behavior? Very good. I think it's very, very good. Um, uh, can you throw light on a one-year MBA at MIT Sloan? Um, it's called the Sloan Fellows Program. Um, SKUs International, SKUs Older. Um, and, um, and not to be confused with the Executive MBA Program, which is a part-time program. Um, terrific then. In any case, uh, 54321, um, you have some information. Please check our website, MBA Mission. Please give us, uh, give us an opportunity to speak to you. For 30 minutes, it is free. Uh, we're not going to do a big sales pitch. By any means, this is the big sales pitch here. And if you have any other questions about MIT Sloan, come and chat with us, certainly. And if you have any other questions, you can find my, my email on the website. It's harold at mbaadmission.com. Great, then. Well, you're all in, just starting a very exciting process here. Uh, I think an MBA, for me at least, was really a transformative degree. And I think, obviously, a lot of work to be done in, before you actually start school. But you're certainly on the right path today by going to this GMAT Club presentation. Very good, then. Well, again, you will see, uh, just scrolling on the bottom here, is uh, GMAT Club is looking to raise money for some of the victims of the Ukraine violence. And at this point, um, if you, uh, as appropriate, please, please give. Very good then, everyone, and, and good luck in this entire process. And I'm Harold Szymanski from MBA Mission.